So now we're finally ready to get started with um, building the models for the birth song classifier project I'm working on. Um, as a reminder, we already did um, the data pre-processing and data cleaning, data extraction, and all the EDA in the prior videos, which you can find in my profile. And now we're ready to move on to building models. So the first thing I did is I um, split the training data set into training and validation set for hyperparameter tuning purpose during training. So I did the 70-30 split as can be seen on this uh, visualization here. And um, after I did the split, I also um, looked at the um, class imbalance again. And um, I will go over this train validation split notebook in a minute. And I will talk about this class imbalance issue uh, when I go over the notebook. And then the other thing I wanted to do is I wanted to create a class methods, which um, um, I created two. One is called framed and the other one is called extraction which uh, um, allows me to kind of work with the um, data sets um, more efficiently, considering I only have very limited RAM, which is 12.7 gigabyte in the free version of the Google Colab. So um, first I'm going to um, go over the train validation split notebook here. Okay, so I already did this notebook. Um, I I'm just, I just wanted to um, go over some of the key points here. Um, if you want, the notebook is obviously my GitHub that you can take a look. Um, so first I import libraries and I load the training CSV. This should be familiar. And then um, this is the same step I did in the EDA when I looked at the total duration by species. Uh, as a reminder, we can see here that Barswa uh, has uh, more uh, audio duration than the other two, you know. So there is a bit of a class imbalance if we wanted to uh, split each of the uh, audio into a, a set duration, say five seconds. Um, so yeah, so first I wanted to do the train and um, test, uh, sorry, not test, the train and validation split. And um, to combat this uh, class imbalance issue during training, I am just going to downsample uh, the oversample class, which is Barswa and UI Guang here, to uh, match the uh, training data for the number of training data for ComSan. And what I did is, so I first find out what's the maximum uh, training duration for each species based on uh, ComSan, which is um, a species with the least amount of uh, audio. And um, here I found out that uh, the most I can have is uh, around 7,600 seconds. And um, I shuffled the data set just, um, just in case. And here I um, did a, um, a section where basically I draw samples from this uh, shuffled data frame until the total, dura total duration for each species re reach the uh, train duration max amount. Um, so I'm just going to go over this line by line. So I first create an empty data frame called train data frame. And then for um, the shuffle data frame, which is basically the original training data frame, uh, which I shuffled up here, uh, I find out what's the primary labels, which are three. Um, so for each of the species, there are three species, I loop over and I found out, find, um, I copy the shuffle data frame for that species into a new data frame. And then I set the duration to zero so that I can keep track of the duration. So while uh, here's a while loop I did where I'm saying while the duration, it hasn't reached the maximum duration, which is the 7,600 seconds here. As long as it hasn't reached this maximum duration, keep going. Right, so first step is uh, I want to sample. So this is basically saying uh, draw one sample from the species data frame, uh, but do not put it back. And I said the random stay here so that uh, this can be reproduced. Okay, so um, draw one sample and I'm gonna put it as a sample and drop the sample from the species data frame. 
and um, then I'm going to find out the duration of the sample and add it to this duration, right? So if say the first sample is five seconds, um, now my new duration is gonna be five seconds. And then I want to add this sample to the train data frame. So uh, it, for the first sample here, my train data frame is empty. So I would only just have this sample. And then as, as um, I continue looping over this uh, while loop, uh, I'm gonna add more samples into my train data frame until the duration uh, reaches the maximum duration of 7,600. And then I will break out of this while loop and then I'll move on to the next species. Okay, so uh, as a reminder, there are three species. And um, after all the three species are completed, I wanna take a look at the chain data frame, the first five rows. Okay, so uh, here I just take a look at the total uh, number of samples. And, and then I look at the total um, duration by uh, species after, uh, after I create the train data frame using using this chunk right here. Okay. And uh, after I have created the train data frame, I basically drop any item, any row that's in the train data frame from the original data frame um, to um, put into the validation set. Okay. So in the validation set, uh, we have um, here 120 ish. Uh, samples per species. And then I also take a look at the duration here. Okay. And I want to confirm that there are no duplicates. So this is uh, where I'm saying uh, there are no duplicates in the training data frame and there are no duplicates in the validation data frame. There really shouldn't be. This is just a check to make sure. And um, also I want to check that uh, the data in the validation set is not in the um, training set. So this is saying if there's um, anything in the validation set uh, that's also in the training set, uh, this is going to return uh, true. And then assert not is present. So I'm saying like, as long as it's not present, it's OK. OK, and then next thing I wanted to do is um, I wanted to add a column into the train data frame and the validation data frame uh, called set where um, basically if it's training, it's gonna be in the training set. And then if it's validation, it's gonna be in the validation set. And then I combine them into this combined data frame. So I wanna do this because um, then every time I uh, work on the model, I'm gonna uh, if, you know, feed in the training data set for the training and the validation data set for validation. Uh, and I only need to load uh, this combined data frame. And I can find out which uh, row goes into train and which row goes into validation by looking at the set column. Okay. And then here, um, I just summarize the, um, the combined data frame by the set and by the primary label to get the total duration in minutes so that I can visualize them. So here we have the training set. Uh, this is the same, uh, pretty much the same code that I did in the EDA section. The only thing I changed is I changed this data uh, so that I only get the training set. So we can see uh, in the training set, we have a, a pretty balanced uh, among the three species, each with around 127 minutes. So uh, the reason we want to create a balanced training set is, um, you know, if we have for example, Barswa has significantly more training set, uh, training samples than the other two, then the model is gonna um, just take a shortcut and um, really you know, have a hard time predicting the other two species, but uh, do really well with Barswa. And uh, we don't really want that. We want the model to be able to learn the features from all three species equally. So basically here, I made the training set balanced. And then in the validation set is anything that's not in the training set is put in the validation set. And you can see the validation set is um, imbalanced. And um, this is expected because um, since our original training data is imbalanced, I would also expect our test data, which we set aside at the very beginning, um, is also imbalanced. And we want the validation set to reflect the distribution um, of uh, uh, the 
test set. So if the test set is the imbalanced, we want the, val inval the validation set to also be imbalanced um, so that we can see how uh, well the model will perform on and the unseen test set at the end. And we can hyper tune the model as needed to um, help the model um, be generalized well to an imbalanced um, distribution. Okay, and um, yeah, so the train val um, is uh, is good to go. And uh, I just um, save the combined data frame into a new CSV called train val CSV. So this is gonna be the CSV file that I'm going to use uh, when I build the models going forward. Okay. And the next thing is uh, I created the class methods. And so here's the notebook that I used to create a class methods. I wanted to create a class methods because uh, I originally just, uh, I didn't create a class methods and uh, started extracting features. And we know that we have, uh, you know, validate a uh, training set, we have 100, so around 300, um, 60, 70, 370 minutes um, of total training data. And um, then we have even more for the validation data. So uh, this is, um, a lot of data to fit into this um, uh, 12.7 gigabyte RAM in the free version of the Google Colab. So I created the um, class methods, which uh, allows me to manage the memory more efficiently. Okay, so um, the class methods took a long time to um, create. As you can see, they're quite large. I'm not going to um, re-implement them here for this video. I'm just gonna go over the class methods so that uh, you have an idea of uh, what the methods are doing. And um, as always, uh, feel free to look at the um, code in the in my GitHub. Uh, so this is a class, class methods notebook in my GitHub. And yeah, so the first thing I did is I imported libraries and um, so I imported uh, the the num, uh, numpy and pandas as usual. And I also imported time because um, uh, as you will see later on, I implemented the time feature in the class method so that uh, it kind of gives a rough estimate of how long the um, the methods will run for. Um, when we have so much data, it's gonna run for quite some time when we extract the features. And uh, Librosa, I think we're all familiar with that, where we uh, extract the audio using Librosa. And then um, for the normalization and average pooling, I'm using the min-max scalar from scikit-learn for the normalization and um, the uh, TensorFlow for the average pooling. Okay, so here I just wanna mention I'm using the min-max scalar because um, the features uh, let's just go to the features real quick. As you can see, the features are um, two-dimensional, right? So we have the time and the amplitude, and uh, we want to use the min-max scalar to uh, squeeze them, to so squeeze all those feature values to be between zero and one, um, so that um, you know if we have multiple features, you can see, for example, if we have um, log scale male spectrogram, which is a hertz between zero and uh, around 5,000 versus the RMS energy is between zero and uh, 0 0.005. Uh, this is a quite a large range and we just want all the features to be between zero and one because um, otherwise uh, if we have a feature that's between zero and 5,000 and another feature that's between say zero and one, right? Then uh, when the model is doing the back propagation to update the weights, the feature that has um, uh, the larger range is gonna uh, dominate the weight. Um, because the if we have a feature that has a very small range, then the model is uh, effectively going to kind of ignore this feature because uh, the weight that's applied to this feature is not gonna have an effect or have very minimal effect to the performance of the model. So I want to um, use the min max scalar to put everything between zero and one so that uh, the model is gonna um, you know, learn the feature from each of, each of the features uh, more efficiently. Okay. So uh, I'm going to go over the two class methods. The first one is called framed and 
The second one is called extraction. Um, before I go into the details of uh, the two class methods, I just want to show you how uh, these um, classes are instantiated and how the, each of the functions are being called so that uh, we have an idea of how these uh, 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 class methods can be used. So first I load the uh, CSV file that I went over in the previous notebook here, the train val split notebook, where I split the training data set to training and validation set. Okay, and here I just did an example data frame where I take the first five rows of a training set um, and then the last five rows, which are the validation set. So this is just an example data frame that I wanted to use to apply the uh, class methods to see if the class methods are function as I intended. So first I wanted to look at uh, the duration and um, this is just to get an idea of uh, how long the duration is. So for example, you can see here, there's one that's only five seconds and there's one that's almost one minute long. Okay, so this is uh, how we instantiate the um, framed method. So um, I have the time here so that I can keep track of how long this is taking. Uh, here, we only have 10 rows, right? So we have the five row of train and five row of validation. So we only have 10 rows. So um, I call the framed method, uh, framed class um, by passing in the data frame. And then I want to pass in the window size and the hop size. So the window size speci uh, specified here uh, determines how long the audio is going to be. So for example, uh, the we have a five second uh, audio here and uh, we're gonna extract five second from that original five second audio. And then the hop size is 2.5. So what this means is there each of the uh, extraction uh, framed audio is uh, gonna have a 2.5 second overlap. Okay, so to visualize this, I'm going to go back to this here. For example, right, uh, if we have a five second audio, uh, we're going to extract um, <clears throat> the only the five second right, this five second chunk, and then we're gonna move uh, by 2.5 second, and then we're gonna extract the next five second. Since uh, we only have five second here, right, well, we don't have another five second to extract. So for this clip here, we're only going to extract the, the five second here. Say that our audio is um, uh, 7.5 second long in total, then we would extract the five second from the first five second, and then another five second from the second five second that starts at the 2.5 second. I hope that makes sense. And okay, so, and then another feature, uh, another parameter is the do augment. So this is also implemented. Uh, remember we uh, looked at uh, some of the augmentation, uh, augmentation techniques. So um, this, if I specify do augment, it's going to augment the um, the framed the uh, audio um, by applying some augmentation technique. Okay, so after I instantiate the framed uh, class, uh, I can get the train data frame by calling the uh, frame dot train df. So this is gonna return me the train data frame, and you can see that I added um, as part of the instantiation, I added a column called framed which is uh, going to return the framed audios, each of each with five second in length, in duration, five second in duration. And they're in tensor, in, in the shape of a tensor flow um, tensors. Okay. And same with the validation data frame. So here you can see the validation set. Uh, we have the framed column added. Okay. And then um, to call, um, to instantiate the extraction class, I first um, specify the features list, which are the features that I want to extract from each of the five second framed audios here. Okay, so here is how I instantiate the extraction class. Again, I put the time here so that I can keep track of the time. And so I instantiate the extraction class by passing the framed th uh, train data frame and validation data frame as parameters. And I also pass in the features list. 
And um, there are also two um, booleans here. One is do normalize. So if I specify true, it's going to normalize uh, all these numerical features. It's not going to normalize the continent type and rating, obviously, because you know these don't need to be normalized. Uh, and because they are uh, just um, uh, uh, you know uh, categorical. And then uh, also for the do average pool, the same thing. For the numerical features, if I specify do average pull to true, then it's going to average pull these uh, features. And uh, as I mentioned before, the normalization is just to squeeze things. For example, uh, the MFCC is going to squeeze it uh, from uh, 0 to uh, 1,000 to between 0 and 1. And uh, the average pooling, um, so average pooling is a little bit harder to understand and I'm going to try to explain it. So for MFCC, for example, uh, we can specify the number of MFCCs to um, for the function to return. Um, I am going to use 20 MFCCs uh, for uh, the class method. So what it means is for each time step, there would be 20 MFCCs extracted. Okay. And then if I do the average pooling, it's going to average the 20 MFCCs to one uh, MFCC only. So for each time step, I'm only going to have one MFCC. Uh, so I am do using the average pooling as a kind of a dimension uh, reduction technique so that um, the model for each um, time step, the uh, model can just look at one MFCC instead of 20 um, so that there is a, a less information for the model to learn so that it wouldn't be, um, sometimes when the dimension is too large, the model has a hard time uh, learning the, um, uh, you know, grasping the feature that's most important. Okay, so this is how I instantiate the extraction method. Um, sorry, the extraction class. And um, I'm going to put it into features. So in the extraction class is going to return um, the, the labels and the features. So I can specify the fee uh, call the features dot train y to get to the labels, and then I can um, get the features by uh, calling features dot train features to get the training features. You can see here, um, you know, we only had five rows, but uh, we were returned forty one um for 41 samples basically uh, because uh you know for each of the uh five rows uh e for example the first one is five seconds this one's going to create one sample and then the second one is 18 seconds this is for it's gonna uh create multiple samples right because uh we have the first five seconds and then we move 2.5 seconds and then we extract the next five seconds so on and so forth so at the end, we ended up with 41 training samples. And we can take a look at the features here. For example, we have uh, the MFCC, as I mentioned here, we have the uh, MFCC is 20, right? Because we have the 20 features, MFCC. And then same as chroma and RMS, uh, spectral centroid, male spectrogram. And then for the continent um, type and rating, it's just one dimensional. Okay. And then we have the validation and then the uh, validation features. Same thing as earlier. And uh, I realized that I explained the average pooling incorrectly because I actually transposed as part of the um, method instantiation. I actually transposed the um, uh, each of the features. Uh, so that uh, I am doing average pulling along the time axis. So let's go back here and uh, try to explain this uh, one more time. So um, what happens is we have the time axis and we have the 20 MFCCs. Uh, you, we can think of the MFCCs as depth. So um, here, when we do the average pulling, we're going to um, basically uh, average pull along the time axis. So in the case of there are five seconds, right? And think of the first MFCC is going to be uh, uh, this one-dimensional uh, one graph here. It's going to have the time and the hertz. 
and um, I'm going to average pull the um, uh, along the time axis so that uh, the first MFCC is represented by only uh, the average uh, along the time axis. Okay, and then so on and so forth for all the 20 MFCCs. So at the end of the day, instead of having um, MFCC of uh, shape uh, time by number of MFCC, we're only going to have the number of MFCC as uh, uh, the dimension. Okay, so now we know how the uh, class methods work. I am going to go over the two class methods in detail. Uh, Okay, so the first one is I wanted to do, uh, I wanna talk about the framed. So what this one does is I'm going to um, first in, instantiate the uh, class. And the first thing is I wanna pass in the data frame, which is the train underscore val.csv, which I loaded into a data frame. And then I uh, remember we, our sample rate is 16,000 and the window size, so these, are uh, default values. Uh, so when I call, uh, when I instantiate this class, um, I don't actually need to specify the window size and hop size um, and the sample rate. If I don't specify, it's going to use these default and same as do augment is false. Okay, so when I instantiate the class, I instantiate the sample rate, the frame length and the frame step. So this is just using the five second time the sample rate. Uh, and to get the frame length and the frame step. Okay, and then I split the data frame to train and validation by calling the split chain val method. So this is uh, um, calling the method by passing in the data frame. It's going to return a train data frame and validation data frame. And let's take a look at this method here. So this method is uh, called when the class is instantiated. And it's um, uh, going to, I pass in a data frame as a parameter. And it's basically going to look at the data frame and say, okay, if the set column is chain, it's gonna be in the chain data frame. Otherwise, if it's in the val, then it's gonna be in the validation data frame. And what I'm doing here is I'm just shuffling the data frame, uh, the chain data frame and validation data frame. Okay, and then the this uh, method is going to return the train data frame and validation data frame. So here, um, this is uh, uh, after I call the method, it's going to uh, return the train data frame and validation data frame. So when I instantiate this class, it's going to um, uh, instantiate um, the all the variables, and it's going to automatically call this uh, split train validation. Um, method and it's going to return me the train DF and validation data frame. And I can uh, extract the train data frame and validation data frame by using, you know, frame.trainDF and frame.valDF, just like how we did uh, down below here, what I showed you earlier. Yeah, so why instantiate the framed? I can use the frame.trainDF to get the train DF and frame.valDF to get the valDF. And uh, if I wanted other things, for example, if I wasn't sure what the sample rate is, right? I can also use framed.sr to get the sample rate. Same with the window size and half size and do augment. Okay, so uh, after we get the train and validation data frame, I am going to extract the framed um, audio from each sample within the train and validation data frame. And I'm doing this by calling the extract framed class. So uh, notice here that I'm not returning anything because um, in this in this method, the extract framed dimension did I say class, it should be the method. So uh, when um, I call the extract framed method, it's going to update the train data frame automatically. So I am not returning anything. Uh, I will go over this method in a minute. So the method takes in two parameters. One is the data frame and the other one is whether to augment. So uh, the augmentation should only be applied to the training data frame. Um, I don't want to apply augmentation to the validation because my test data is not gonna be augmented. I, some, I may want to do the augmentation so that the model can be more robust to um, um, 
the unseen uh, validation and test. Um, so yeah, so I can specify the uh, data frame and the whether to augment as parameters. Okay, so now let's move on to the extract framed uh, method. Um, okay, so the extract frame method, as mentioned, is uh, taking the data frame and augment as the parameters. So the first thing I do is uh, I want to create a um, empty list that stores the audios, the framed audios, okay? So the first thing is uh, I'm going to loop over the file names and uh, underscore MPY, and uh, I, I'm going to load the, the audio using the mp.load. Remember our uh, NumPy objects were extracted in one of the earlier notebooks, and um, they are saved in the chain underscore MPY folder. And you can see here, for example, in the bar swap, we have all the um, audio files that has already been loaded and returned as a NumPy object and saved as the NumPy object. Okay, so I'm going to load the audio. And if the augmentation is true, uh, call the augment function. I'm going to um, uh, leave this uh, for a minute. Just know that we also have an augment function that we can call to apply augmentation. And then uh, once the audio has been augmented, um, it's going to give me the augmented audio. And then um, if it if augment is false, then it's not going to call the augment function. And then uh, I go, I'm going to add the audio to the audios list, okay? So here the audio is still of the original length. So if the original audio is uh, 10 seconds, the audio here is gonna be 10 seconds, okay? And I just wanna assert that um, uh, at the end of the for loop, I have uh, looked at every single row within the data frame. And then I want to extract the framed audio. So I create another empty list to store the framed audio. And uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to loop through each of the audios um, in the audios list. Okay, so for example, the first audio is 10 seconds. I am going to uh, use this uh, tf.signal.frame function to um to frame the audios to the specified frame length with the specified steps okay so uh this is a built-in tensorflow function uh, that uh, you can take a look in the documentation but essentially i pass in the original audio 10 second audio and i uh, pass in the frame length so frame length here is going to be five seconds and the frame step is going to be 2.5 seconds and uh, I don't want it to pad n. So what does it mean to pad n? Say that I have a um, five second audio, right? I extract the first five second, all good. And then uh, I move 2.5 second, and then I want to extract the next five second, right? But my audio doesn't have another five second. I only have another 2.5 second. If my pad n is true, then it's still going to extract five second, and then the last 2.5 second is gonna be blank, basically all zeros. And I don't really want that. I just want uh, my audio to have um, own, I don't want it to have blank. I want it to have um, the, the sounds. Okay, so I just specify pad n is false. So this is going to return the framed audio as a um, tensor. So this is gonna be a list um, um, of tensors that I'm going to put into the frame. Okay. So for example, the first, uh, we can take a look at uh, here. Um, so the frame is gonna be a list of the tensor uh, objects. Okay, so when the in the case where there's the duration of five seconds, it's going to only have one object, tensor object. And then if the duration is, say, 7.5, then it's going to have two tensor objects. Uh, both uh, They're all stored in this list that's uh, going to be put into this framed column. Okay. So, um, yeah, once I extract the framed audio, I put into the frame list. And then again, I assert that I have looked at every single audio in the audios list. 
And then I add the framed audio to the original data frame. So this is how uh, I have that extra column that's being added. And uh, I don't need to return anything because I'm uh, updating the original data frame. Okay. So uh, now I'm going to talk about the argument. Remember if uh, we specify argument is true, uh, then it's going to um, call the argument function and apply the augmentation to the audio object. So here's the argument function. It takes the audio, it takes in audio array, array, array as a parameter and it's going to return an audio array as um, the augmented audio array um, uh, to be passed to the, um, you know, the extract frame function here. Okay, so when I call the augment function, I have um, four choices. I either want to keep the um, audio as original, or I want to apply noise, or I want to um, uh, shift the audio along the time axis, or I want to change the pitch. Okay, so um, remember earlier, we talked about the augmentation techniques, and one other one is stretch. Um, notice here that I actually didn't put stretch in this list. It's because say that we have an audio of uh, 10 minutes, right? Then if I apply the stretch to the 10 minute audio, um, it could make the audio become 20 minutes, um, depending on how long, how much I want to stretch it for. And uh, it could make the audio very, very long. So uh, this is going to create a problem since we only have very limited RAM. So I only want to apply a uh, stretch if the audio is short. Here, the definition of short is arbitrary. So I just said, if the audio is less than seven seconds in duration, then stretch it. Otherwise, uh, don't stretch it, but uh, you can apply any of the other augmentation technique. So this, the which one uh, will be chosen is completely random. I want to just apply random augmentation. So I apply either noise, uh, Gaussian noise, or I shift the audio along the times axis, or I change the pitch. And it could also be that I don't want to apply ran just by randomly the, uh, I chose the original, so the audio is uh, not going to be changed. And then at the end, I'm going to return the augmented audio array, which is gonna be passed um, into this uh, 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 extract framed method again, and that's going to give me the augmented audio. Okay. So that's all the uh, method for the framed um, class. And so we can see there are three methods. One is to split the train validation. One is to apply augmentation. And one is uh, to extract the framed audio. And uh, uh, as mentioned earlier, we can instantiate this by passing in the data frame as a parameter um, to instantiate the framed class. And when the class is instantiated, it will automatically call the split chain val uh, method, and it will also automatically extract the framed. Um, if the do argument is um, set to true, it's going to also apply augmentation to the training data set only. Okay, now that we have the uh, framed audios um, added to the train and the validation data frame, we can um, call instantiate the extraction class. So this class is quite large and it has a number of um, methods as we can see here. So I'm going to um, again start from the top. Okay, so when we instantiate the extraction class, we pass in a train data frame and validation data frame, which can be extracted from the framed class, right? So we pass in a train data frame, validation data frame, passing both at the same time, um, the reason I want to pass in both at the same time is because if I want to do normalization or average pooling, um, especially normalization, um, I should use the uh, training features um, as a scalar to apply the normalization. Okay, so I pass in the train data frame, validation data frame, and then again, these are um, default values. So um, I have the sample rate. The number of MFCC is 20, which is the default from Librosa. Number of uh, male spectrogram is, I also reduce it to 20. And 
the default is 128. Again, this is kind of a um, uh, um, dimension reduction technique. So instead of um, having Librosa extract 128 mil spectrogram, I only want to extract 20 per time step. Okay, and then 12 uh, for the number of a chroma. So chroma is uh, for a pitch and uh, there are uh, 12 pitch classes uh, by default. And then the features, uh, by default, I only pass in MFCC, but uh, uh, we'll go over like the the accepted features and they should be passed in as a list. And then do normalize is default to true and do average pooling is default to true. So um, one thing is if we want to extract MFC, all the um, features that's listed, all the accepted features here without doing average pooling, uh, the kernel will crash because um, it's going to exceed the 12.7 gigabyte RAM. Okay, so uh, just keep that in mind when you're working with this uh, class method. Okay, so I instantiate the class variables here, and then I confirm the features have been specified. So essentially, if I pass in features equal to an empty list, it's going to um, throw an error, basically saying you must specify at least one feature in the form of a list. And then I also want to confirm that uh, I've passed in the valid features only. So the valid features are uh, in the list here. And if I pass in a feature that's not valid, for example, if I misspelled spectral centroid, it's going to throw an error, okay? So make sure that uh, only the valid features are being passed in. And then um, when the method, when the class is instantiated, it's going to automatically uh, it called the extract features uh, method. So um, I'm going to go over the extract features method in a minute. I pass in the train data frame and the validation data frame separately to extract the features, which is going to return me the labels and the features. And then I'm going to process the features by applying the normalization or average pooling by calling the process features um, method. Notice here, I pass in both the train features and validation features at the same time. Uh, again, the reason I wanna do this is because uh, the normalization should, on, should really be normalized based on the train features as a scalar. Okay, and then the process features is going to return the train uh, processed train features and validation features. So uh, all these are being called automatically when uh, the class is uh, instantiated and I can extract the train features and uh, train Y and train labels and the validation features and validation labels by um, you know, uh, doing the extraction dot uh, train features or extraction dot train Y. And I can also uh, get any of the other variables as well by uh, doing, for example, train dot accepted features. This is going to give me the list of accept accepted features because I instantiated it here, okay? So now I'm going to go over the functions. The first one I wanna go over is the extract features function. So that one is at the very end here. Okay, so uh, for the extract features class of a method, I am going to pass in the data frame as a parameter and it's going to return a tuple uh, of the label and the features as a dictionary. Okay, so the first thing is I want to uh, time this so, so that um, the user has a kind of an idea of how long this is going to take. So I first start the time and then I display that the feature expression has started. So I first create an empty list and an empty dictionary. So the dictionary is gonna have the features as keys. So for example, if we specified, um, what is it? specified MFCC and Chroma, then it's going to create a dictionary of MFCC as a key and Chroma as another key. Okay. And then um, I'm going to iterate through each row of the data frame. And I'm using the iter row fun iter rows function from pandas. Uh, so here it's going to uh, basically iterate through each of the row in the data frame. And I can get the label from the primary label column and the frame 
um, is going to be the framed column. So remember, the framed column is going to contain a list of framed audios, each with five seconds in length um, in the uh, with the tensor object, right? So I'm now going to loop through the list, the framed list. For each of the frame, the five second audio in the framed list, the label is going to be the same as um, the primary label. And then if I specify the continent, I'm going to get the continent. If I specify the rating or the type, I'm going to get the rating or the type. OK? So um, now I have uh, the features, right? So uh, remember, in our example, I said uh, we're going to extract the MFCC and Chroma. So this is going to um, loop through each of the features. and. I'm going to say, okay, so for each of the features, loop through the features and display that I started extract. Um, actually, no, this is not displaying. So this is, I, I'm using a dynamically, uh, I can dyna dynamically call the extract feature function. So here I uh, created the extract underscore feature function, uh, which I will go over in a minute. And um, I dynamically pass in the feature name for example, it's gone, the, the function is called extract underscore MFCC, or the function is called extract underscore chroma, and it's going to dynamically call that. And uh, this is uh, where I'm calling that function. Okay, so uh, the result of the, fun uh, of the function where I extract the feature is going to be added to this dictionary. So uh, for example, if I have a chroma here, I'm gonna uh, say, you know, if the key is chroma, put the uh, feature into that dictionary with the uh, chroma key. Okay. So now that I loop through each of the features, right, uh, then I'm going to have the features dictionary, which is going to contain the uh, all the features for the framed, for each of the framed audio. And then I want to loop through each of the framed audio. So in the case of, uh, for example, a 7.5 second audio, I'm going to have two framed audio, each with a five second in length, um, in duration. And um, since I have the 2.5 second step, right? So each with five second duration, and I have two. So this is, it's going to run through this loop twice. And it's going to create uh, you know, two labels. Uh, each of the label is going to be the primary label. And then um, each of the uh, features dictionary is going to contain the features for that five second framed audio. So there's going to be two dictionaries and two Ys. Okay. That's going to be added into the, the Y list. Here is the append. And then also added to the dictionaries list at the end. Okay. So after all of the uh, uh, the data frame has, like each row of the data frame has been looped through, uh, I want to cast the shape of the features into a NumPy array. And same as the casting the, um, so here, you know, we have the list and same, similarly for the dictionary, we have uh, a, the, each of the uh, feature is gonna be in, in the form of a list. With the, with the feature as the key, and then the value is going to be a list. So um, each each of the um, uh, list is going to be cast to a NumPy array. Okay, and then it's going to display that uh, how long this took. Okay, and then it's going to return the label and the feature. So now I'm going to go over this extract underscore feature function. So this um, is being dynamically uh, called. Uh, whenever the feature that um, is uh, uh, specified in the uh, parameter list. Okay. So here is the extract uh, function and you can see um, the MF, we have the extract MFCC, M M Chroma, RMS, Spectral Centra, and MEL Spectrogram. So, um, which is why it's important that we have the correct spelling. So if we spelled spectral centroid incorrectly and we try to call uh, extract underscore spectral centroid with the wrong spelling, there is no function um, that's going to match, you know, extract underscore spectral centroid with the wrong spelling. Okay. So uh, 
having a correct spelling, uh, make sure that the these functions can be dynamically called successfully. Okay, so uh, each of the function is just using a Librosa feature extraction um, functions to extract the, um, the features, uh, specified features. And I'm passing in the NumPy array, the audio array object, and then I'm passing in um, the sample rate and the number of uh, features I want to extract from each of the uh, Librosa feature extraction functions. And then I transpose the um, returned feature. So um, it returns in the shape of uh, time um, with, uh, with uh, uh, either amplitude or hertz, uh, you know, or the based on the feature that's uh, specified. And I want to transpose it. I want to transpose it so that when I do the um, normalization and average pooling, it's going to normalize an average pool along the time axis. Okay, so I do that for all the, uh, the features here. Okay. So now I have successfully uh, called the um, extract features methods for the train data frame and validation data frame, which returned the train label and the train features and the validation label and validation features. And then I'm going to call the uh, normalization, the process features function to apply normalization or average pooling if my I specify them to be true here, right? Okay, so I'm going to call the process features function, which is down here. So this is a process features function. Um, again, I pass in the train feature features dictionary and the validation features dictionary as the parameters. And it's going to return a tuple containing the normalized and or average pooled training features dictionary and validation features dictionary. Okay, so similar as be earlier, we want to um, time it and display that we have started the feature pro uh, processing steps. So for each of the features, so this is saying, uh, what is the keys? The keys are the features, right? So for example, in our case is MFCC and Chroma. So for each of the features, if the feature is a continent rating or type, they don't need to be processed. So I'm just gonna pass. So if I do pass, then it's not going to, it's going to skip this whole chunk here. Okay, so, uh, but if it's not continent rating or type, so if it's a numer numeric feature, then <clears throat> it's going to say, um, go to this else statement. Okay, so in the else statement, I want to um, pass in the number of features. Okay, so I have the, M if it's MFCC, then the number of features is gonna equal to the NMFC, MFCC, then the chroma and the male spectrogram. And then if it's RMS or spectral centroid, the number of features is one, okay? So <clears throat> here I'm indexing into the dictionary to find the list, okay? So for example, I have uh, MFCC as one of the keys. So I index the um, dictionary to find the list, the features list that matches MFCC, okay? So, here we have the train features, and then I'm saying if I uh, do normalize and do average pulling, then what, what are we gonna do? We're gonna pass in, we're gonna call the normalization function by passing the train features, validation features, and specifying the time step, which is gonna be the train features at uh, shape one. Remember we have um, the shape zero is gonna be uh, the end features, and the shape one is gonna be the, um, the time step. And then we have we need to pass in a number of features, and uh, the normalization function is going to return a tuple um, containing the the list of the chain features uh, and the validation features for the specified feature, right? And then uh, this is uh, I'm reassigning it so that it overrides the original list in the dictionary, and then so I call the normalization and I call the average pooling. And then if I only want to do normalization, it's only going to call the normalization. If I only want to do average pooling, then I only call the average pooling. And then if I if I don't want to do normalization and I don't want to do average pooling, then it's just going to return the original thing. It's not going to change it, okay? So 
uh, then at the end of this, I'm going to, uh, you know, here we're uh, looping through each of the features, right? So if I started with MFCC, it's going to say MF display MFCC processed. And then the next one is going to loop through this whole thing again, and then say chroma processed, uh, so on and so forth, until the entire list of the features has been processed. And then it's going to uh, display the time and say that how long it took. And it's going to return the dictionary of the uh, train features and the validation tree features dictionary that has been processed, okay? So now I'm going to go over the normalization and average pooling uh, functions. So the normalization function, again, it takes in the features, the train and validation features as parameters and then uh, time step and the end features as parameters. Okay, so the first one I want to go over is normalization. So the normalization function is, again, uh, we pass in the training and the validation features, the time axis and feature axis. So first thing I want to do is I want to flatten. So because our features are uh, in 2D, right? We have the n times, um, times the n features. I want to flatten this so that uh, it's um, uh, 1D. And then I want to use the min max scalar to normalize the chain of validation features. Uh, see here how I only fit the min max scalar on the chain training data uh, to create a scalar. And then I transform using the same, using the scalar to transform the chain and validation features. This is important because uh, you don't want to in, um, accidentally gain any information about the validation set. So um, the key is I only want to fit onto the training set. So I use the scalar um, that's being fit on the training set to transform the training and validation. And then um, I want to reshape the feature back to its original shape, which is the end, end, the end, end time and end features shape. And then I am returning the normalized train X and train Y, uh, sorry, train X and validation Y, uh, train X and validation X. Um, to uh, the, this function here, which is going to override the original feature before the normalization, okay? And then for the average pooling, it takes in the same parameters as the normalization. Um, the only difference is for average pooling, I'm, I'm, I'm using a TensorFlow to achieve this. So I first specify the TensorFlow input, and then I specify, uh, I add a global average pooling 1D layer to average pool. And um, then I'm going to pass in the input um, to from this uh, global average pooling layer. So this is actually a uh, functional API um, architecture where I pass in the input uh, as a, as an input to one of the layers. Okay, and then I um, instantiate the TensorFlow model. So this is a very simple model. My model is not predicting anything. My model is only taking the input and then uh, output is gonna be only passing through this layer of a global average pooling. Okay, so this is where I instantiate the TensorFlow model. And then I will um, use this model to predict. Um, I use the dot predict method from the model to average pool the train X and uh, validation X. Okay, so um, now that uh, we have looked at, I think that's all the functions in the um, extraction class. Remember the first thing we did is we uh, called the extract features method within the class, which is at the very bottom here, we extracted the uh, labels and the features dictionary for um, the train and the validation. Within this, we have um, called each of the extract features function dynamically, which are here uh, based on the features that's been specified in the um, original list uh, parameter. And then uh, I we also, and then after that, we um, call the process features method, which processes the features um, by calling the process feature method here. And within this method, uh, it depends on whether we specified normalized um, and or average pool. It's going to call the normalization or average pooling method to normalize and uh, average pool the features. Okay, and then at the end of the day, this um, 
method, uh, this class is going to um, provide us the um, extracted and processed features and labels for the chain and why, uh, for the chain and validation. Okay. So now that uh, we have um, looked at the uh, class methods, let's take a look at um, our code again, where we um, ran the method on the example data frame. I think this should now make more sense where, so first we instantiate a framed class um, and it's going to give me the framed um, object and I can uh, access the chain data frame and validation data frame by using framed.chainDF and framed.validationDF. And this is going uh, give me the framed um, column, which contains the tensor object of uh, the five second framed uh, audios for each row. Okay, so in the case where each row is more than seven point five seconds, it's going to this is this this row is gonna be a list of uh, multiple five second audios. Okay, and then I specify the features list, and then I instantiate the features. Um, feature extraction, feature extraction class, uh, and you can see here where um now the time kind of makes more sense. It's going to say feature extraction started, and um the, you know each of the feature is going to um extract um so this is doing chain and then this is doing validation, and then um you can see here where I did the MFCC and then chroma and RMS. So this is processing it. And these are actually the output from the TensorFlow average pooling layer. So um, and here you can see we're doing that normalization average pooling, and then it's going to tell me that it has been processed. Same here. I'm just going to ignore the these warning signs here for now. And then it's going to tell me um, how much time in total this took, the whole feature extraction and processing uh, step takes. Okay, so now uh, my features uh, class has been instantiated. I can access the chain Y by doing features.chainY, and then I can access the dictionary of chain features by doing chain features. And here I'm just printing out, displaying the uh, each of the features that uh, was uh, included in the chain features dictionary. So I'm looping through the keys, and then I'm displaying the key, and then I'm displaying the shape, of of the uh, values and then I'm displaying just the first item within the within the list. So for example, we have 41 um, for our training um, data training set. We have uh, 41 examples, 41 samples, each with uh, uh, each with 20 MFCCs. Okay. So this is just the first example, right? First example of 20 MFCC. And um, similarly for chroma and for RMS, spectrocentroid, mouse spectrogram, and uh, continent type and rating. Okay, the same thing for the validation set. We can access the features uh, dot val y to get the um, validation label and the features dot val features to get the validation uh, features. And that's it. I know it's a lot, but um, I hope you can um, take a look at the uh, class methods in GitHub to um, you know get a better understanding how these uh, class methods work. We're gonna be using these class methods when to extract the features when we build the models in the future uh, videos. Thank you, and uh, I hope you can tune in again for future videos when we start building the models as well.